The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Kobus, fake news has been a hallmark of the China-Africa relationship for a long time. And we really don't call it fake news in the early days of doing this. That's a relatively new concept, and I would say introduced into our vernacular and the lexicon by the Trump administration. But before we called it fake news, it was negative narratives. There were these durable myths. I mean, early on, it was about these myths that, again, have improved incredibly lasting and durable. I'm sure you've heard of some of them, like the Chinese are exporting prison labor to work on construction sites in Africa. There's no evidence to support that whatsoever. Of course, there's the debt trap narrative that is very popular in many parts of Africa and the U.S. and Europe as well. Uh, we've not heard any evidence of this. Researchers have gone up and down the continent looking for proof of it, and it has not materialized. Uh, some examples. Uh, the Zambian power company Zesco has been handed over to the Chinese in lieu of making debt payments. That was actually put forward by former National Security Advisor of the United States, John Bolton, in his big speech on U.S.-China-Africa policy. Not true. Uh, we've heard that the port of Mombasa will be seized by the Chinese because it, uh, for failure to pay debts. Although it's in a contract that it is up for a piece of collateral, it has not been seized. And then, of course, there's the Zambian National Broadcasting Corporation, ZNBC, that was forfeited to the Chinese. Again, not true. None of these, of course, are true. And again, there is a lot of documentation and evidence to support it. If you are not sure about that, just look it up and really look at Deborah Braudigam. There's a Matt Furchin. I'm trying to think of, you know, all the different researchers that we've had on our show who have debunked so many of these myths. But for many years, these myths just plotted along and there was a certain consistency to it all. But all of that started to change in April with the events that happened in Guangzhou and the countless videos, photos, and accounts of discrimination uh, against Africans and African Americans uh, that happened in response to COVID-19 and people being evicted from their homes and hotels and all of these different things that kind of coalesced together back in early April. So the social media feeds get filled with all these different videos of people out on the streets and people being mistreated. There was a certain period early on in this crisis when you could have a strong level of confidence or high level of confidence that what you were looking at was actually authentic. As the crisis subsided a little bit, what ended up happening, Cobus, was a lot of new videos started coming up filled with rage and anger, but those videos were highly, highly misleading, uh, if not outright fake. They were taking instances out of context and saying that this was in response to what happened in Guangzhou, beating up, for example, Chinese people, or in turn, they were taking instances of anti-black, anti-African, uh, discrimination in China, but it was from many years ago, and misrepresenting it, and it became really very confusing. Now, let's layer on top of all of that Chinese propaganda, which of course denounces uh, fake news, but also traffics in it as well. And so, Cobus, we're in this stew, this toxic stew of information that really has, as part of the flavoring, a lot of people's insecurities about the China-Africa relationship, whether you're looking from the Chinese side towards the African side through their own propaganda, or vice versa, from the African side towards the Chinese. And then on top of that, there's the US and Europe that's all mixed in it as well. And it makes it really very difficult for news consumers and people on social media to figure out what's what. To my mind, there's a bunch of old factors and then a bunch of new factors involved. The old factors being that, you know, historically, um, you know, Africa has, Africans have not gotten good information, either from their governments or from, from other governments. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on in the, in the relationship between Africa and the rest of the world, um, particularly in relation to issues like debt. And we're seeing some of that at the moment. Um, and there's also kind of broken lines of communication 
fragmentation and broken trust between African governments and African people. Um, so frequently things would be happening on the ground, but they would be denied by governments or you know f you know in the past as a journalist when one interviews african african politicians sometimes they they would you, you would point out a problem and they would be like oh no that problem doesn't exist you know show me the proof you know that 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 kind of that kind of swagger you know um so what you then get is is rumors and gossip functioning as a form of news circulation system you know where where people do don't have access to good information you know end up having to depend on rumor you know, to, to try and find what's going on. So that has been an old problem, but that problem has really been exacerbated by the rise of Trumpism in the first place, you know, and the, the kind of embrace by the Trump administration of, of rumor and innuendo and un, unproven facts sent out as, as tweets, you know, uh, just as, as a diplomatic tool. And then other countries' response to it, you know, so, so you have this kind of tit-for-tat kind of information battle from between China and the US, in which both sides are frequently very, we're very happy to, to use either full-on misinformation or, or to draw misleading connections between unrelated issues. In response to all the different things that Cobus has mentioned about the difficulties in Africa of figuring out what's what, there's also been a, a rise of a new industry that's come up in the past, I would say, six to 12 months, which is fact-checking. Uh, there's a great site called Africa Check, which I recommend you add into your media diet if you don't already use it. Uh, I've met some of the guys who work on that, in, and they're, they're just amazing. Uh, also, newspapers like uh, the Daily Maverick and the Daily Nation have fact-checking teams now that are debunking lots of these myths. Reuters, for example, is also, some of the news agencies are doing it, and that brings us to AFP Fact Check. That's the French news agency Agence France Presse. Uh, they have a new team called AFP Fact Check. I think they're working also with Facebook, and they're publishing out content, and they've been working a lot on these China-Africa narratives and videos and fake news that have been coming up over the past uh, few months. And we're, so we're thrilled to have one of the editors and one of the journalists who works on that team from Lagos, Nigeria, Maiwa uh, Tijani. Thank you so much for joining us, Maiwa. Thank you for having me, Eric. Before we get into the details of China-Africa videos and all of the fake news that you try to debunk on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, I think it'd be interesting for us just to get a better understanding of what is a fact checker like yourself and how do you go about actually determining if a piece of content or a piece of news is fact? Walk us through the process that you go through to verify and authenticate news. Okay, I, I think the first, the first angle where we start from is looking at a piece of information and seeing what is the larger context for this particular piece of information. So uh, more often than not, you see videos, pictures, messages going viral on social media and passing a certain kind of image, passing a certain kind of information about a certain group of people. And then we start to question the intent, the motive, um, the medium and then if, a few things by the time you we ask a few questions on a particular piece we that we then get to see if this has to be checked or not so um, in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic one of the things that we've seen a lot has been uh, misinformation about cures and prevention misinformation about um, China and um, the rest of the world and then of course a lot of misinformation about how Africans are treated in other parts of the world so when we see a piece of information that is remotely viral and that has um, a certain potential to do some harm we try as much as possible to say okay this can we check can we find out if this is entirely true there are there are some pieces of information that we get that is not um, false in itself, but the context in which it has been presented can just make everything extremely different from what was intended by whoever was, uh, whoever said what in the first place. I'll give you an example. Last week, Melinda Gates said that well, she was she was speaking on the vaccine, which was which is of course still in development, and she said that she was asked that who should be the first set of people to get the vaccine. And she said, of course, healthcare workers, people who are in the front line. And then the next question was, okay, after healthcare workers, who should come next? And the answer she gave was, she thinks that black people 
and people with uh, ethnic minorities in the U.S. should be next. And the reason why she was saying that, she went on to explain that the reason why she thinks black people should be the first is because black people, as we have seen by the numbers in the U.S., happen to suffer a lot more. We've seen a lot more cases, a lot more deaths amongst black black communities where the outbreak is. So she was basically trying to say that we should give the vaccine to pe to persons who are affected the most. Then another website picks that piece of information and says that Melinda Gates has said black people must be vaccinated first. Now, in the wake of the entire information about Bill Gates and um, how they are trying to take over the world and all the other conspiracy theories, if that particular information, despite the fact that she said it, the way it is now being presented fits into a kind of narrative that was not the initial intended purpose. So we have a lot of situations like this that would have to set straight. So in, in the, the stories that you deal with in, in a standard week, um, and, and I, I assume it, it changes from week to week, but, but you know, it roughly in a standard week, roughly what proportion has to do with China compared to having to dealing with other issues? Well, since the outbreak of the coronavirus, we've seen an increase in the stories we deal with from China. But uh, personally, of course, as somebody whose focus is largely on Nigeria, um, the amount of China-based kind of fact-check that we do, um, I'll probably put it at, say, 20-30%. Wow, that's a high number. I didn't expect it to be that much. On some weeks, it gets that high. On some others, it goes really low. But since the outbreak, there's been a lot of China-focused fact-check than we've had in the past. Well, walk us through some of the different themes of the topics related to China-Africa fact-checking or China-Nigeria fact-checking that you encounter on a regular basis. Okay, so um, basically the ones we see often is first Nigerians or Africans destroying um, Chinese stores or Chinese properties. The, the, those are the ones we see on the Africa side. And then on the other side, we see videos or articles or what have you claiming that um, China is, um, persons in China, the Chinese people are maltreating Africans, maltreating Nigerians. Um, so we've seen a lot of videos. Of course, um, there are videos that were from the past that are being represented now in 2020 as recent uh, COVID-19 driven kind of discrimination videos. So we, we see that too. And then we see a lot of conspiracies around China has a cure, but they are not sharing with the world. And they want the world to, maybe they want to control X, Y, Z across the world. So those are like the things that we see reoccurring here in Nigeria. What is the kind of breakdown between conventional media as a as a forum for distributing this kind of fake news versus social media? We've seen obviously in the US there's there's fights between uh, between some social media services like Twitter starting to fact check some of the some of the tweets, particularly also President Trump's tweets, um, and then you know kind of uh, entities like Facebook refusing to. Um, and I recently read research pointing out that in Africa, particularly this was focusing on on East Africa, um, they WhatsApp is a particular kind of particularly strong kind of forum for distributing misinformation. So how how does conventional versus social media break down? I think a lot goes on in a lot of misinformation goes on on social media now than in the conventional media. Um, what you probably likely see in the conventional media, a uh, conventional media are near truths, so a, a mixture of what actually is happening and then a misrepresentation of that kind of information. That's the kind that you see in conventional media. But on social media, you find a lot of totally fabricated piece of information. And then you also find um, videos. Of course, videos move faster on social media. So, of course, I see that the social media giants are, fight, are, are trying to tackle misinformation in the ways they think they can. Uh, but personally, I'm of the opinion that there's still a lot more that can be done, uh, especially on WhatsApp. 
in Africa. Of course, WhatsApp being the most popular instant messaging app in Africa. So there, there's a lot that needs to be done within that space. But it, it still comes down to the question of privacy versus um, right information. So how do we, how do fact checkers, for example, get into the core of messages flying around on WhatsApp? If you were Facebook or Twitter, it's kind of, it's open. So you can check a tweet that, uh, from someone you're not following. You can look for a particular piece or a video or something and you find it. But this is not the case with WhatsApp because of the end-to-end -end encryption and then the personal messaging system that he runs. But of course, a lot, a lot of misinformation goes on there. And we try as much as possible to fact check the ones that get to us. But there's still a lot out there that doesn't get to us. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa Channel Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. The Chinese government claims, and they've said this on many, many occasions, that the fake news or the misleading news or whatever you want to call it coming out of Africa towards China, the anti-Chinese videos that we've seen, are influenced by uh, anti-Chinese Westerners. They use the word Westerners. Uh, that is U.S. Mostly they're talking about the U.S. And there's this idea that it's coming, you know, all this negativity about the Chinese is coming from the U.S. and Europe, and Africans are kind of internalizing that and then putting it back out into these fake news. That's that's the best reading that I have on it. It's highly condescending, very paternalistic, uh, but nonetheless, that's the way that it's being framed in a lot of Chinese state media and from Chinese government spokespeople. Who are you seeing or who do you think or is it even possible to identify is behind this wave of fake media and fake news and the different reports. Do you believe that there is, is it organized? Is it organic? Is it just chaotic? What's, what's a little bit, when you think about who puts this stuff out, who is it? That breaks down into a lot of um, different parts. So the first, there are a lot of Nigerians who are very skeptical about China, who would go out and put any sort of information to just say China is doing what China is not doing. And there are also a lot of um, people who are also skeptical about the U.S. and, of course, the rest of the West, who would also say that the U.S., for example, the Bill Gates conspiracies and all that, who would put all of that out. Now, there are persons who bounce off both, who would take stuff from the China part, take stuff from the U.S. part, and then fuse and make some piece of misinformation and then put it out there. But in my understanding of the way misinformation works in this part of the world, um, I, I've been able to break it down into three. The first is financial power, the second is political power, and the third is soft power, which is like the fun part of it. Now, for the financial power, we see that a lot of persons who put out this misinformation just do it to get... Um, clicks to get traffic to their websites and when they do that of course they get a lot in they get much more than they would normally do in google rev, google ad revenue so basically they make money from this misinformation and then there's the political power aspect of it so there are a few persons within the political space in nigeria who um oil they are following, let me put it that way, who oil the machinery that drives their following by sharing a certain kind of misinformation that aligns with the group But do you people. see any evidence that what the Chinese are saying, that this is being influenced or driven by the U.S. and Europe? I do not, I, I don't think we have that much evidence for now. No. Well, let's get into a few examples of some of the different instances, say, for example, in Nigeria. Um, there was a fire back in April, uh, on April 15th and the Dugbe market in Ibadan. Talk to us about what happened there and the fake news that emanated out of that, uh, that fire. Actually, on the day this particular fire was, um, this particular fire happened, the fire incident, I actually was around the area. 
So I was just seeing fire from a distance and I'm like, oh, what's happening there and all that. And basically just spoke with a few persons and they were like, oh, they had the fire break and this and that. And that was it. And so I did not even see it being an issue immediately. So it was the following day that um, I got a mail from one of our brewers in also West Africa saying that, oh, this particular video is going via in... I think one of these French speaking countries and of course some parts of Nigeria that um, what exactly happened and this and that and you know for someone who saw the fire the previous day I was like oh this is quick and so I, I put the call through to the police to ask okay what exactly is happening a lot of persons are saying that this is um, this is an attack on the Chinese and all that and for the life of me, most of the shops that were involved, at least the ones I saw at the distance, they were not Chinese shops. And um, it, I, I do not think that the Chinese have as much um, investment in that particular market as we are being tried to make to, to believe, so to say. So eventually, the police said they were still investigating that they do not have... Um, they, they do not have any particular... They've not gotten to the root of the cause of fire. And then they said as soon as they do that, they will let us know. But based on pre preliminary information they had, they could not tie anything to any attack on China. But of course, um, social media had received that kind of information that it was an attack on Chinese shops and this and that. And... A lot of people seem to run with that, especially in the light of the attacks against Africans on the other side of the world. So um, it, it basically, like we said earlier, played into what people would naturally, in quotes, what a certain section of people would naturally want at this time. So that was why it was a bit problematic uh, to deal with. Kobus, you've been a longtime media scholar, and I'd like to get your reaction to this, because it seems like each one of these videos has an emotion behind it. So the Ibadan fire that Mayowa was just talking about was this idea of retribution against the Chinese for what they've done to Africans and black people in Guangzhou, whether it was the uh, video of, I think if you recall, this was a video that was actually shot in Malaysia uh, back in 2015, 2016, but was presented as if it was contemporary of three or four Chinese men beating up a, uh, a, a young African man. This video first came out uh, in 2016 in Zambia that it was and was presented as if uh, these Chinese men saw this black guy dating a Chinese girl and therefore they wanted to beat him up. So it was, again, always an emotion that's underlying it. And in those cases, it was insecurity. Look what's happening and victimization. Look what's happening to us by the Chinese. Talk to us a little bit about the emotions that you see driving some of these media narratives uh, on social media. You know, it's, it's frequently a story that sounds incredibly convincing or sounds like it just makes sense, um, which, you know, which, which is, then becomes the basis of, of misinformation. And this is something that, that we've seen going back a long time. This is, you know, obviously this is, a, this is an, in, an inherent kind of human foible um, that we tend to be, you know, that, that our, um, our processing of facts tends to be overridden by our, you know, our, our tendency to look for patterns. Um, and this is, you know, something that that communications scholars have been pointing out for a long time, for you know, right through the 20th century, and it forms the basis of a lot of of, prop of classical propaganda theory, you know, around the Second World War, for example. Um, that has just picked up speed um, with social media, um, you know, because because we we can't if one looks at social media, you know, it's it's just kind of like. It's a, a kind of a ribbon of un, unrelated images um, that only makes sense when you when you have some kind of like meta discussion around the images you're seeing. You know, so you only, you know, it only makes sense. You only see someone on a beach, but then, you know, kind of when the, it, that makes sense as a story why, when you see, oh, you know, this is our second anniversary and we're returning this time to Capri or whatever, you know, that kind of story. Um, that, 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 that is the basis of social media communication. Um, so, you know, what you find in, in this kind of situation is that the story needs to make a 
sense or it feel it needs to feel like it makes sense and in that sense it reflects i think you know buried misgivings that people have about the relationship in this case the china africa relationship and assumptions that they have about the relationship so one of the assumptions would be that china that there is no such re- thing as real south south cooperation that that chinese people will always feel superior to foreigners and particularly to black people for example you know so so that kind of that kind of narrative then an, an image then seems to to be the the final piece of the puzzle that just reveals the entire truth, um, you know, and 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 frequently, as as one knows, as a journalist, the the frequently a reality as a journalist that you need to deal with is you, is you have a set of kind of muddy and inconclusive pieces of information, and your job as a journalist is to make those those pieces understandable and to put them into place, and you know, so so you you're walking this kind of very dangerous tightrope where you tr- you have to you have to impose some form of narrative in order to make it understandable but any kind of narrative you impose is inherently artificial Um, and you know kind of when you look at real pieces of evidence frequently as a journalist they tend to each piece reveals complexities so many complexities that they frequently aren't space to fit them all into a narrative and I think that you know kind of that's an inherent problem with with presenting any kind of information as as proof of something you know in order to have proof you, you kind of have to impose this artificial narrative on top of a, a set of disparate pieces of information. Um, uh, Mayowa, I, I wanted to just, just kind of, re- re- you know, linking to that, um, w- one of the things that, that seems to me very difficult in your job is um, is to deal with video and particularly to deal with the provenance of video. Um, so how do you work when you get a piece of video that doesn't have a date, doesn't have any kind of, of that kind of metadata on it? And to to then say, and it's presented to you in a particular kind of way, like, oh, see, this is this is what's happening here, and you know, kind of what you're seeing is a a, a piece of video showing a lot of blurry fighting, for example, and you don't know exactly where it is, who it is, what's what's the context. How do you go from that piece of video to trying to find context for it? Okay, um, thank you very much. There are, there are a number of ways we deal with videos. Uh, I'll start from the easiest, and the, um, the simplest way we deal with it is. Um, if we can get a clear frame from within the video, we take a screenshot and then we run reverse image search with that particular screenshot. Now, if that video has been uploaded to YouTube or maybe some other social media networks, what we find when we run a reverse image search, we find places where that video has been used. In some cases, of course, like I said, that's the easiest. If we find places like that, we can say, we can then, okay, this video has been here since 2016 and this was, if we are fortunate, some of the cases would have what originally happened. In some other cases, we would have video from a later date, but maybe repeating the kind of misinformation that was presented to us. So, we know that the work is not done, we would have to continue. Now, the second way we deal with it is... Um, there's a lot that we do with geolocation. So when we look in a, into a, in a video, we, we try to pick up the signs, uh, maybe plate numbers, if it's a public video, um, maybe street signs. There, there was a recent one we worked on that um, was shot somewhere in Italy and it was presented to us as... as um, a video from London where an African was beating a particular policeman and all that. And so the first giveaway was that the sign on the jacket that the policeman was wearing was not in English. So first thing, find what, what language that was. Number two, um, street signs. We found street signs that um, were showing, okay, there was a particular street sign that was pointing in the direction of a particular bank. So we searched for where that bank is. And of course it was easy. We found the bank in Italy. And then um, from there, we were able to trace a few things in Google Maps to see if we can find specific spots where that happened. And eventually we were able to find what where that particular uh, video was shot. Now, in some situations, um, geolocation might also not be enough. This is where we count on the strength of our network as AFP. Of course, having presence in 
over 150 countries um, we can if we for example maybe the language in the video can maybe give us a clue that okay this might be in a Portuguese speaking country for example if the language in the video is Portuguese and so we send it to we send that video to our bureau over there and then they try to um, get who is speaking what they are saying and it, it, pieces of information here and there would then lead us in where to look and then how to search for some of the videos and then in some cases all of this would not work all of this will not work we will not find a place the screenshots would, would not throw up any um, new video, old videos um, our guys would say they are not certain about where this exactly happened so in that particular kind of situation we would have to do like a combination of all of these things and of course AFP has developed a certain um, video verification tool that we call we verify and that particular verification tool also helps in breaking down a video and giving us more information as to what to look at and where to look to so it, it gets very some videos we don't get to the bottom of it but for a lot of videos we've worked with it some of them might just take some time but we most often get to the end of it. So let's close our discussion with hopefully some helpful tips for our audience to better understand how to approach social media content that they may not know the origin or the authenticity. And this is now a really a pertinent problem because in China, Africa, content analysis and in terms of all the different information that everybody's consuming, there's a lot of fake news. And some of it's coming from governments, including the president of the United States, comes from China, comes from uh, lots of different stakeholders, but it also comes from the web and organic and part of the chaos that you talked about that is today's social media. What would you recommend, some practical tips for people to, when they see a video or they see a photo, that they look for to determine if it's authentic or not? Okay, so uh, I would say that the first place to start is the motive, the intent behind that video. So if, if somebody is sharing a video or a picture with you, the comments they are attaching to it is often the place to start. So they could just say, um, this video was shot in China last week, and this is how they were treating XYZ. Now when you have that, the first piece of information that they give to you, that's the place to set, to start. So you could just um, type that out in any search engine and say um, how Africans, for example, the videos about um, burning Af um, Chinese stalls in Nigeria, you could just type it out and say how Nigerians destroyed Chinese XYZ in so so place. And that when you do that, the first thing you probably see are news reports about China, Nigerians, and um, maybe the fire incidents. And when you see news reports in that manner, you are able to check and say, okay, is this really what this person sent to me? Is, is the news, does the news report tally with what the person has sent to me? So when you start from there and you find out that, oh, it doesn't, it does, that's a place to start. Now, like I also said, the screenshot of a video, which of course I feel like is the easiest thing to do when it comes to video verification. Take a screenshot, um, go to Google, type Google reverse image search, you find an opportunity to upload the picture, and then if that picture has been on the internet, if that video or picture had been on the internet before, you get results that show you maybe sometimes the context or sometimes the um, information. But um, one of the things that you probably cannot teach is what um, I call like your, it's like a sixth sense. And that is thinking that if something is too good to be true, it most likely is too good to be true. So if, if they are saying, if the information you're getting is remotely unbelievable, is likely not to be believed. So once you have that kind of information, it might not be a picture, it might not be a video, it might just be a text, WhatsApp BC. You just pick out the major claims, search for it in the mainstream media, 
and then you might find some information in that direction. Maya Wetajani is a journalist at the AFP Fact Check based in Lagos. He's also uh, been a business journalist in Nigeria for a very long time and really just on top of his game when it comes to fact checking. A new form of journalism, really, that's emerged in the past couple of years and critically important. Uh, Maya, if people want to follow the work you're doing at AFP and what you're reading and writing these days, what's the best way for them to stay in touch with you? Um, they could just go to factcheck.afp.com or follow me on Twitter at TJ. Great. I'll put links to both of that. We really appreciate you taking the time and sharing some of your insights on this super important subject and, uh, and really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Kobus, throughout the discussion with Maya, I just kept struggling in my head about how to separate a lot of the, the, the filth and the garbage and the fake information that we see just pop up on social media all the time with what comes out of governments. I mean, again, there is no bigger liar on social media than Donald Trump, who I think the last count, I don't even know what the last count, but it's in the tens of thousands of lies. And ironically, he's the one who, who kind of popularized the word fake news, but he is not also one of the instigators of it. Uh, certainly, and again, this is contentious, but the Chinese government is involved in this kind of stuff, and big governments all are. It's part of their, I think, their information warfare campaigns. And now, it, again, I come back to the key question of how do we as consumers figure our way through this mess? And I just think we have to be disciplined. If it is too good to be true, as he pointed out, it is too good to be true. And these, and, and in so many ways in the China-Africa story, this fake news has built upon the foundation of misinformation that has existed in the China-Africa relationship from the beginning. The debt trap narrative, the labor issues, uh, colon colonialism, imperialism, all of that stuff now it just feels like it's you know, on steroids and being boosted up. And it's hard for people to kind of figure out what's what. But at the end of the day, so much of what I see is, going back to Maya's point, is it validates what people already seem to believe. So if you believe that China is the worst thing that's happened to Africa, you're going to have videos that will validate that. And you'll say, see, here it is. Similarly, if you believe that China is the best thing that's ever happened to Africa, you're going to have those videos and those stories and those photos that will validate that. Uh, that is that is just the reality that we live in today, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's always a safe a safe bet that something is kind of somewhere in between. Um, but, you know, it's, it's such a difficult issue because, of course, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about whether the social media platform should be regulated or not. And there's a lot of good arguments for both you know, to, to in, in both directions of that argument. Um, and it, it, it's, it still raises the, the very the very thorny issue of who is really supposed to be regulating them and then also who is supposed to decide what is true or not, you know. Um, and that is an almost impossible question to ask it's the, you, because the moment you have a ministry of truth, then, of course, you're in Orwell country. Um, but at the same time, without some kind of shared your sense of reality or shared truth, it becomes very difficult to get anything done. Um, and that, I think, is what we're seeing in the U.S. at the moment. You know, it's like one of, one of the aspects of the gridlock in the U.S., the political gridlock, is that no one no one um, believes the same set of facts. You know, so it, it becomes very difficult to set priorities, for example. Um, and, you know, I, th I think we see the same problem in the China-Africa relationship. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of problems in the China-Africa relationship and some of them are not receiving enough attention because fake non-existent problems are, are sucking up that the oxygen in, the, in that particular room. You know, so it becomes a very kind of difficult line to walk. Well, it's interesting, and we'll talk a little bit about what we do here at the China Africa Project and why what we do, what we think is so important and what motivates you and I every day to do this. And the fake news is not going to go away. This is a reality that will be with us now in perpetuity. It's just, a, it, there's no way, because as you said, there's no shared facts. There's no arbitration. There's not going to be a court uh, that you can bring a claim to. Because, a, you know, one person's truth is another person's lies. And so there's just no reality of governing this thing. And it's just going to be with it. So in that way, that's why, again, there's, I, I believe in journalism uh, that is going, that journalism that is good and that is balanced and that people trust is going to come back and vote. And people will end up paying for it. It's not necessarily going to be free. And I think in this post-COVID era, it's going to be expensive. If you want higher quality information, you're going to have to pay for it to support people like Mayowa or people like us and what we do. And 
you know, that's what we do every day is we're trying to go through and to sort out what's what. And we're trying to debunk a lot of the fake news. So we'll, in our newsletters and on our website, we'll say, this is just not supported by facts. And we'll put three links to it that says, here's researchers that contend this from different points of view. And so I think that's going to be the best weapon for consumers is finding sources of information, people that you trust, that you've er that have earned your trust over years and years and years, not necessarily in three months or two months, and sometimes challenge your worldview as well. You may go into a piece of information thinking that you know what it is, and then the journalist or the organization or whatever it is challenges you and says, well, think about it this way, and here's some alternative sources of information to, to, to present to you. So in some ways, I think this, again, is a, a real call for, for journalism and journalism that matters. And, and I'm hoping that there will be a, a flight back to quality uh, for some of this as people seek out more balanced, more contextualized news and information. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, I saw a very revealing um, statistic this weekend. I was reading about all of the different struggles and ructions that's going on at, at Condé Nast, um, particularly in relation to racism within particular some of their, their, um, their publications. Um, and very interesting detail that through all of the years, you know, kind of like decades and decades, Vogue magazine was always the largest earner for Condé Nast in the US. And they've, they're about to be overtaken by the New Yorker. Um, and the New Yorker is, you know, kind of the New Yorker is essentially kind of recession proof at the moment or, or anyway, sheltered by, by against the recession, unlike Vogue, because the New Yorker isn't advertiser dependent, they're subscription dependent. Um, and to have this kind of like, you know, decades and decades of, of kind of sterling reporting that they, that they can, you know, kind of, is, which is essentially their calling card, you know, um, so they trust it and therefore they are solvent, you know, and if that, if that particular um, you know, kind of alchemy can be can be replicated in other newsrooms. That would, of course, be amazing. Once again, let's give you a little checklist of some of the sources that you can go to to do fact checking. There's AfricaCheck.org, uh, obviously AFP Fact Check. Uh, there's Reuters is doing fact checking as well. Uh, there's Politifact in the United States. They don't do things uh, about. Africa too much. Politico, interestingly enough, uh, has filed a couple stories about China, Africa, and fact-checking over the years. So some of these more traditional international and U.S. news agencies are getting into it. But Africa Check, I think, is one of the best ones, as well as AFP Fact Check as well. And of course, the China Africa Project, because we're trying to do the same thing. De definitely not with the resources that groups like Africa Check have. But when it comes to our issues that we cover in the China-Africa relationship, we definitely try to disseminate uh, important information to clarify a lot of the fake news that does exist out there in an impartial and biased way. So that'll do it for this edition of the China and Africa podcast. If you want to get daily information, you love this kind of topic, you've made it to the end of the show, uh, you will definitely want to sign up for our daily email newsletter. We have a special price just for those of you who made it to the end of the show. Uh, it's $99. It's a third off, normally $149. But because you guys have our most loyal audience, we save it for the end of the show as a little Easter egg. Uh, just use the promo code PODCAST, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, and at checkout, and we'll give you 50 bucks off uh, for a year's subscription. So that's a great deal. Try it out for free for two weeks. See if you like it. This is where Cobus and I are writing every single day on issues like fact-checking, uh, all the different topics that we see coming out of AFP Fact Check are kind of then presented in our newsletter as well. So it saves you time by just putting everything together. So that'll do it until next week. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs>